Good morning. Uh, it's an uh, honor to be here, so thanks for inviting me. I will present two uh, new papers. Uh, you can find them in your information packages. Like this. One is on the impacts on the pollinators, and the other one is on the impact on aquatic ecosystems. So I start with the impacts of neonicotinoids on pollinators. The pollination is important for various reasons, you see it listed here. It's one third of our world food production requires pollination. Most of nature, the economy, needs a lot of pollination. And our health, because most of the key nutrients from fruit, etc., also come from pollinator mediated crops. So systemic insecticides, of which the neonicotinoids are the most important class, were invented uh, in the 1980s and first introduced on the market uh, in 1991. And the most widely used is imidacloprid. And this person got a prize for this invention because it created a revolution in plant protection. <laughs> So here you see the chemical formula of imidacloprid, and what strikes is that it has a chlorine uh, atom in the molecule, so it's an organochlorine compound. And it works systemic. Systemic means that the plant takes it up in the roots and makes the plant toxic from the inside, so it is translocated to all parts of the plant, not only to the leaves, but also to the pollen and to the nectar. <laughs> So here we see the trends of different categories of uh, uh, pesticides. Uh, and the years go from uh, 1997 to 2010. And these are the neurotoxic insecticides that work on the acetylcholine uh, complex. So we have organophosphates, carbamates, and neonicotinoids. And you see a decline of the, uh, of the organophosphates and carbamates, and a rapid increase of neonicotinoids. So what you can see is that now 26% uh, of the world insecticide market is neonicotinoids, so it is the most widely used insecticide. And here you see others, and one of the others is fipronil. Fipronil is about 7 or 8% of the world insecticide market. It's also partly systemic, so if you add it, 
that it's more than one third is either male nicotinoids or fipronil. It's are both very problematic for pollinators. Now here you see some figures for the total. Uh, imidacloprid is the most widely used neonicotinoid worldwide. So from this family, this is the most widely used. Uh, and the total volume is about 20,000 ton. Now the other neonics together are about the same amount, so together it would be about 40,000 ton of neonicotinoids worldwide. If we compare that to DDT, that was the problematic insecticide in the 1950s, it peaked in 1959, and then the world production was 80,000 ton. So for the neonicotinoids, it's about half of the world production of DDT. So keep that figure in mind. We are about at half the world production of the peak, the world peak in DDT. Yeah, that's the next one. で、ネオニコチノイドすべてをえっと、泡、ニマトワクチンのニマトワ。で、ネオニコチノイドすべてを泡せると溶和酸素を使えていました。で、えっと、50分に積極、50分間が、えっと、使用量のピークだったそうです
、えっと、コーラードエビに暴露されることが非常に大きな問題となりますが、この暴露の経路に関してはいくつかありまして、まずは、えっと、産婦、この親が産婦などに直接接触してしまう、えーあえっと、産婦の粉塵に直接接触してしまう経路、また、えっと、えー、と後継、経口、あ、経口ですね、口から入ってくる、えっ、ー、と、経路がありまして、これは、えー、蜂蜜だとか、えっ、ー、と、花粉、あとは、この、もうやっぱり汚染された水などを、こう、口から摂取することによって、暴露されてしまいます。There are some other exposure routes, like、uh, nesting material, for instance, resin taken from trees and also used to make propolis, wax、uh, also taken from All kinds of plants,、uh, but also, for instance,、uh, leaf cutter bees. They cut fragments of the leaves and use them to make their nests. So these are solitary bees, and they make, they use parts of the plant to make nests. And then the bees can also get directly into contact with plants that are sprayed in one of the neonatal communities.、Uh, and also bumblebees, they make their nests in the soil, so they can get into contact with contaminated soil and get poisoned. 他の経路としては、えー、と巣の材料となる、えー、と木のヤギですとかあと、えー、プロポリスなどの,、えー、とこの汚染された、えー、材料、まあ、植物から作られるということあとは、えー、ハキリアリなどがこう葉っぱをこう切り取って巣に作るんですがこれも葉っぱが汚染されているかを結局巣、えー、全体も汚染されてしまいます。それからえーと花などに直接散布される農薬から摂取することもありまして、その他には、えー、と丸,丸花鉢など、えーと、土壌の中に巣を作るタイプの鉢に関しては、土壌の汚染というのが、えー、とバックの費用になります。Another way by which bees can get into contact is through cooling water. Bees bring a lot of cooling water to the hives on warm days to keep the hive in the right temperature range. So, they evaporate a lot of water, so they have to bring it to the hive. If the water is contaminated, the water evaporates, and upon the contamination, the poison remains in the hive. So, <laughs> the first、uh, pathway was through pollen and nectar. Now, the first thing you would think about is treated plants, like corn, where the seeds are coated and it translocates into the plant, and then the, the pollen and nectar of the treated crop are toxic. But in the Netherlands, we did some measurements in willow trees, willow trees that grow near surface water. If the water is polluted, then the trees drink the water and also translocate the poison from the pollution in the water into the trees. It ends up in the flowers of the tree, and you see a bee here, a bumblebee, collecting the pollen of the tree. And we actually found、uh, imidacloprid and tiacloprid in the pollen of the trees, of wild trees that were not treated. えー、とまずは、えー、と花粉だとか、鎮痛の汚染に関してなんですが、これは、えー、とトウモロコシの種を、えー、この農薬で処理することによって出てくるという問題が指摘されていますが、オランダでは実際、えー、とこの農薬で使用された水の近く、えー、生えている木が、えー、とその水を介して、この農薬に汚染されまして、この木に咲いた花、からも、えー、とこのネオニコチマリド、えー、とイミダクロプリドや、えーとえー、とチアクロプリドなどが検出されています。So it actually also translocates to wild vegetation. ですので、えー、とこうした農薬というのは、えーえー、と野生の植物の、えー、と農業だけじゃなくて、農業から出て野生の植物にも汚染というのが広がる可能性が非常にあります。Now, if we look at the effects that it has on pollinators, such as honeybees and bumblebees, then we can distinguish different types of effects. It can be acute exposure, which is a single time, or chronic, which is every day a little bit. 
Uh, and it can be lethal or sublethal. So lethal, then the bee dies immediately within 24 hours. And sublethal means the behavior of the bee changes because of the nerve poison. And finally, we have synergistic effects, and that means that the sum of two different factors cause more effect than each factor individually. For instance, imidacloprid and an infectious disease, uh, and the imidacloprid makes the bees more vulnerable to the infectious diseases. Now this is an example of acute toxicity. What you see here is the beehives in Slovenia, and in front of the hive you see thousands and thousands of dead bees. And what happened? They were sowing the corn. This is corn, and it is coated with uh, glotianidin, one of the neonicotinoids. And then the dust that came free during the sowing, it killed the bees. So this is the result. <laughs> で、見てお Now this is some uh, results from Japan, from Professor Yamada, and it shows what happens in the long run to the bees if you expose them every day a little bit. And here they tested uh, clotianidin and dinotefuran uh, at different uh, concentrations with dilutions up to 100 times below the, the concentrations you find in the field. And then we see that if you use a lower concentration, the only thing is that it takes longer until you lose all your bees, but still uh, the bees, the beehives collapse and go to zero bees. So. So what we learn from this is that a lower concentration means only a longer time to kill the hive. But not, it's still not safe. It's only a longer time to collapse the hive. Lower concentration, longer time. Yeah. So these were acute and chronic effects where the bees die. 
And here we see examples of the effects found, which we call sublethal, so changes in the behavior of the bees uh, and, uh, in the navigation. So here are some examples. We see changes in navigation and orientation, so the bees lose their sense of uh, orientation. Changes in the feeding behavior, and changing in memory and learning. えっと、damage that you can see under the microscope, so permanent damage to the brain, changes in the larval development, the development of the larva takes longer, especially between day 4 and day 8, this takes a longer time, and changes in the differentiation of tasks in the colony, and the latest findings from Japan are also that the bees retire earlier. <laughs> えっと、8の脳に、えっと、大きな障害が出てきます。それから幼虫の、えっと、成長、特に、えっと、4日目から8日目の成長が非常に遅くなってくる。それから8の巣の中でいろいろな役割分担があるんですが、この役割分担に、
leads to a 85% reduction of the number of queens. So normally a hive produces 14 queens, one four, uh, and the exposed ones produce only one or two queens per colony. え、2 Okay, so to conclude on what we found on the pollinators, and then I go on to the macroinvertebrates, on the pollinators we found that at normal use, the concentrations that occur in the field, they produce a wide range of subletal effects, effects on the behavior. And all these effects weaken the colony and make the colony more prone to diseases. And then we see that there are only a few studies that have studied wild bees. So we have 25,000 different species of bees, but we have knowledge on only a few. We know something about the honeybee, something about the bumblebee, but what about the solitary bees, what about the osmia bees, what about all the other the leaf cutting bees? There's almost no scientific information yet, so there's a huge data gap. But a few studies that are available show that the effects are similar for all wild bee species. <laughs> So it seems that the protection of bees should be a higher priority and therefore we need alternatives, urgently alternative practices for neonicotinoids. So this was the first part of the lecture. The second part is on the macro invertebrates. It's shorter, so don't worry. Uh, and here you see uh, water in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is very flat. So my country doesn't have mountains, uh, but a lot of polders, reclaimed land from the sea. And there you have a lot of ditches. So this type of water with no clear direction of the stream. And then there are fields with bulbs and flowers. And there are greenhouses and there they use the pesticide. Now we looked at some translocation studies and then you find that only a small fraction of the applied amount of insecticide actually goes into the plant and the rest goes directly into the environment. So for corn it's 20% that goes in the plant and 80% goes in the soil and the water. Uh, and for other crops it can be 1.6%, so then 98.4% uh, immediately leaches into the water and the soil. え、残りの 
Now here you see a map of the Netherlands for different years, and it shows the, the violation of the uh, immunoglobulin water quality standards, standards that are there to protect aquatic life, to protect the aquatic ecosystems, and all the red dots mean that the standard is exceeded by at least five times. So we were able to study the impacts of this by combining the chemical measurements with biological sampling from eight years of monitoring data. And we collected the data from all the water boards in the Netherlands and they routinely monitor the water for the amount of macroinvertebrates and for the amount of chemicals in the water. And because we combined eight years of monitoring data from a nationwide, uh, monitor, nationwide monitoring network, we got very big amounts of data, so that enabled us to do very detailed uh, analysis. And it included data on 4,000 different aquatic species. Now we found uh, a very negative impact, so a negative relation between higher imidacloprid means lower amounts of the species, especially for the following types of species, the crustaceans, the flies, the mayflies, the dragonflies, the damselflies and the snails, but also for all the species together. Then we found one group of species where imidacloprid seemed to be an advantage because there we found more of the species at high pollution levels and these were the water mites. So we found more water mites at very high concentrations. So somehow imidacloprid seems to favor mites. Now here you see some of the data plots and what you see is on the horizontal axis is the imidacloprid uh, concentration and it's a logarithmic scale and on the vertical axis, it is the abundance, so the number of species, or the number of individuals from that species. And the way it is done, you have a standard net, and you pull it through the water, and then you count the catch in the net, the number of insect uh, uh, larvae, etc. <laughs> So what you see in such a diagram is that there are no points in this upper triangle of the diagram. So it means that at high concentrations, it's almost uh, impossible to find high amounts of individuals of, uh, of a particular species. So it's logarithmic, so this is hundreds and this is thousands of species in, in one catch. And you see that after some uh, level of imidacloprid, you never find more than uh, 10 or but not 100 uh, or 1000. Therefore, you need clean water. So, 
何を示しているかというと、イミダクロプリドの濃度が高ければ高いほど、生態生物の、えー、と数が減ってしまうということで、えーとえー、放射能薬の量、まあ、濃度が低くないとり、生態系には非常に大きな影響が出るというのではないか。So only for this creature, the w a t e r m i t e we see the reverse, and we see very high abundance、uh, at very high concentrations of imidacloprid. And then we really see more than thousands of these、uh, mites、uh, per catch. So then we did a comparison for all the species together, so for all the aquatic life together. And、we divided the samples, all the samples in the database, in two categories、uh, all the clean water, that's here, and all the water that violated the 13 nanogram per liter maximum level, maximum allowable level in the water. And we see that everywhere where the norm was violated,、uh, the average abundance was 70% lower than in the clean water. えー、と生,態えと生態系の中の生物すべてを合わせた量を、えー、ときれいな水、その規制が守られている、基準が守られている水と、えー、とその基準が守れられていない水で比較したもので、えー、と色の濃い方が、えー、ときれいなものだと思いますが、えー、と見ておられるように非常に数が、えー、と減ってしまう、汚染された水では減ってしまうことが多かったと思います。70% 下がってしまうことが多かった。Okay, and the samples were taken、uh, on 800 different places in the Netherlands. And from the eight years, there were more than 9,000 water samples. And 45% of these 9,000 water samples from eight years, 45% violated the standard. So it was above this 30 nanogram per liter threshold. So this is 45% of the water, has too little species in it. Because of the imidacloprid pollution. でこのデータというのは8年,の8年間にわたって約800箇所から9000ものサンプルが水のサンプルが取られているんですがそのうち 45% がこの13ナノグラムという基準を守っていない水でして 45% では非常にこの生物の数というのが減っているのかお分かりだと思います。Now we want to understand also why this is the case, because this was only an analysis of the data. So we also looked in the literature for the toxicology. And here we see that there is a relationship between the concentration in the water and the time to mortality. So it,、uh, it means this is both a l o c t r a n s f o r m a t e d scale. It means that the lower the concentration, the longer it takes to kill the insect, but you can still kill it. And then, the, if the angle is、uh, flat, then it means that the toxicity is amplified by exposure time. So, the longer the exposure time is, the more toxic the molecule works. どうしてこういったことが起こっていくのかということを、えー、と文献で調査しましたところ、この表は、えー、と横軸が、えー、と農薬の濃度、で縦軸が死亡率なんですが、と見てわかるように、えー、と非常に低い濃度でも、時間がかかりますが、まあえー、と致死性であるというのがわかります。And then we look back at our data, and it was indeed confirmed that this was the case because those species which have a very long aquatic lar larval stage, like the mayfly,、uh, these species are most vulnerable and they die at first. For instance, the mayfly it lives for more than half a year and sometimes more than two years in the water as a larvae, and then only one day it lives as a fly to make sex and to propagate. でえー、とこの、えー、と水の中に住んでいる生物というのは、えー、と非常に、えー、寿命が長いものもいまして、特にカゲロウなんかはこうした汚染に非常に弱いんですが、それは多分なぜ,なぜかというと、幼虫である時期が大体、えー、と
半年から2年間、水の中で過ごすんですが、えー、とこうした時期に非常に長い間、農薬の汚染に暴露されてしまうことになりますので、えー、と成虫になって一瞬、えー、と後輩して、えー、次の世代に継いでいくんですが、えー、とそこまで生きられない家業というのもたくさんいる。So that brings me to the conclusion of the second part of the talk.、Um, <coughs> well, in the Netherlands, we find that 45% of all the samples、uh, has e m i t a c l o p r i d that exceeds、uh, the maximum tolerable residue level in the water, and that l e d s to a 70% reduction in aquatic life in this polluted water. We also saw that there is permanent leaching from the fields to the water. So, there is not a peak, but it's all year round, it is high levels of e m i t a c l o p r i d e t t h a t s me, the Hapio, the Hatsu, 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 the h a t でこうした、えー、当選というのは、特に年間、えー、と1年を通して、どこかにピークがあるわけではなくて、年間を通して、えー、高いレベルになるということが分かっています。So then finally, we did some calculations to find what has to happen to meet the, to make the water clean. And we found that the amount of use per year has to be reduced by 90%. So a massive reduction in the use is the only way. To meet the aquatic standards and to、uh, allow the water to recover from this massive pollution. Okay, thank you very much.、Uh, if you have questions, please ask them. Flowers from the Netherlands, 
They use a tremendous amount of neonicotinoids and they both are excluded from the bed. So you can still use it in the greenhouses, you can still use it on the flowers and these are the main causes for the leaking to the water. So for the water it will not help. の、and then we saw that if it's in the water, it also goes in the trees, and the trees translocate it to the pollen from the willow catkins, etc. So it remains in the environment. So the bees are only helped partially, but still encounter a lot of pollution in the landscape. <laughs> え、木だとか植物からまたえっと花が出て花粉や花粉が発生するから、えっと、また蜂だとかこのえっと風の開花者が汚染されていってしまいますので、ま、多少はもしかしたら変化が出てくるかもしれませんが、大きなところでは何の